Hello, my name's Becky and I'm here with Gardena as part of their Chelsea Flower Show Celebration Week. Today I want to talk to you about plant science. Why are plants so fascinating? We know that they look good and they are literally everywhere, but plants really are more than that. Part of what makes them so interesting is how little we know about them. Did you know that we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about what goes on underneath our feet where plants' roots are? There are so many unanswered questions in botany and that really does make it fascinating. There are two main types of plants, the vascular plant and the non-vascular plants. Non-vascular plants are the mosses, algae, hornworts, liverworts, and not the kind of plant that we usually invite into our garden. So today I want to talk to you about the vascular plants. Vascular plants are plants that have evolved two types of vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. The xylem cells are responsible for the transport of water and some diluted nutrients up from the roots to the rest of the plant. The phloem is responsible for the transport of carbohydrates from the leaves down to the roots and also the transport of other nutrients from the roots to the rest of the plant. Let's take a moment to talk about xylem cells. Xylem cells are really interesting because they're a part of the plant that isn't actually alive after the growing phase. Now bear in mind that alive cells need feeding in order to be able to carry out their function. So xylem cells die off and are still able to carry out their function just simply as a structure. They're really high in a polymer called lignin which gives them their rigidity and stops them from breaking down. Without these vascular tissues, plants simply can't grow up. So it's easy to spot non-vascular plants because they're usually very short. There are around 400,000 species of vascular plants in the world, with thousands more being discovered every year. Around 370,000 of these species are flowering plants. Flowering plants are super interesting. Did you know that some plants can actually increase the amount of nectar that they have in their plants available to pollinators simply by hearing a pollinator coming? Yeah, that's right, plants can hear. Other flowering plants have developed mimicry, so they encourage bees and other pollinators to mate with the plant. This means that they don't need to use energy to create nectar and instead they encourage the bees and the other pollinators to come in for more nefarious reasons. Some flowering plants, such as jasmine, are meant to be pollinated by moths. So they have white flowers and they release a scent at night to attract the moths. There are other flowers, such as the aubergine flower, which won't release any pollen unless it detects the specific vibrations created by a bee's wings. This is called buzz pollination. There's so much diversity in the world of flowering plants. It's almost mind boggling. And one of the wonderful things about flowering plants is they really do like to show off their diversity too. So how do we define plants? Well, one of the key differences between plants and animals is the structure of the cell. Plant cells contain two things that animal cells don't have. The first is a cell wall. Now, all cells have a cell membrane. This is what stops all the parts of the cell from falling out. But plants specifically have a cell wall, which contains high levels of lignin. Lignin is what gives it its rigidity, and this is what helps plants to stand up. Xylem cells, i.e. the cells found in stems and trunks, are higher in lignin than other parts of the plant, for example, the leaf cells. 
the other thing that plant cells contain that our cells don't contain is a vacuole. And a vacuole is again used to maintain its rigidity in the cell and it stores mostly water. Most of us have heard of photosynthesis and we know that our plants photosynthesize. Now there are two different types of photosynthesis, oxygenic and anoxygenic. Anoxygenic doesn't produce any oxygen and is really quite rare. So today we're going to talk about oxygenic photosynthesis. Oxygenic photosynthesis is by far the most common and it works by using the sun's energy to transfer electrons from water molecules to carbon dioxide molecules to produce carbohydrates and oxygen. We know that most plant leaves are green and this is because they contain a pigment called chlorophyll which is green which is used to harness the sun's energy but there are also plants that use different pigments to harness the sun's energy like for example this beautiful red lettuce another thing that's fascinating about plants is their ability to interact with other organisms for example fungi some fungi actually grow into the cells of plants' roots and create a sort of symbiosis whereby the plant feeds the fungi and the fungi tells the plant where to find water and nutrients. The fungal network in the soil is super important for plants and is almost like a internet of the soil for them to communicate with one another and to find out information. There's so much diversity that it would be impossible to cover it all in this one session. But it's important to understand the diversity because then we can understand what creating an ecosystem looks like. Different plants have adapted to support different organisms. And if we plant lots of plants and a huge diversity in our gardens, we can attract lots of organisms into our gardens and produce a really healthy ecosystem. To create an ecosystem in your garden doesn't need to be really complicated and you certainly don't need to use just native species. In fact, the more diversity and different types of plant we can have in our garden, the better for our wildlife. And of course, the more wildlife we have in our garden, the better it is for our plants too. Plant reproduction is also really interesting. Some plants can reproduce simply by sending out a runner from their roots. These are called rhizomes and they grow under the ground and just pop out another plant. Of course the other plant is genetically identical to the parent plant, which isn't really that advantageous to the original plant. A much better way of reproducing is to combine your genetics with another plant and this is where pollination comes in. Pollination is the process by which one plant fertilises another to produce a seed. For plants and for animals, combining genetics is a really good way of making sure that your genetic pool stays diverse, which helps fight illnesses, diseases and other problems. Plants use several different methods through which to pollinate one another. Pollination is basically plant fertilisation. Some plants simply release their pollen into the air in the hope that it'll find another plant to pollinate. Others use more specific methods like pollinators. Pollinators include bees, butterflies, moths, hoverflies, amongst many, many others. These pollinators come to the plant in search of something, usually nectar, and they accidentally carry away some pollen. When they go to another plant, they deposit the pollen on the top of the stigma, which then travels down into the ovary and fertilizes the egg. This produces a seed. The seed is then distributed by the plant in order to produce a new plant. Sometimes these seeds are really tiny and they can be carried by air to another location where they can hopefully establish. Sometimes they are encased within a fruit and in which case the hope of these plants is that the fruit will be consumed and the seed will be deposited somewhere else by an animal. Other seeds are carried on water and designed to float on water, such as the coconut, so that it can distribute itself far and wide. 
there are lots of interesting ways in which seeds disperse themselves in nature and really I can't even touch on the subject here. When a seed lands somewhere that's suitable for it to germinate, the first thing that it'll do is put out a root. This is called the taproot. The taproot goes down. Then what happens is the seed puts out leaves. Now some plants put out one leaf and these are called monocotyledons and some plants put out two leaves, these are called dicotyledons. The cotyledons or the seed leaves are different from the normal leaves of the plant in most cases. These leaves are contained within the seed and they help to generate the first bit of energy that the plant needs to get going. They're really important for the development of the plant but they're also really edible. So as gardeners we tend to raise our tiny seedlings with these little seed leaves away from most pests where possible. Most plants will only flower when they reach maturity. This is because flowering takes an awful lot of energy on the part of the plant. However, some plants will set out a flower if they are in a particularly stressful environment. For example, if they're experiencing drought stress. As gardeners, we seek to raise healthy, strong plants that will flower because they are happy. And there are so many different ways in which we can make our plants happy. Respecting the plant's life cycle and natural needs is all part of understanding how to garden and being a good gardener. At the end of the day, we are the custodians of our gardens and our plants are the residents, so we really need to look after them.